be concerning to some, but paganism continues in Christianity. The truth is, many aspects of Christianity came from ancient pagan religions, not the Bible. Celebrated holidays like Christmas and Easter were not sanctioned by the Most High, nor were they practiced by the early believers. We need to ask, why are so much of modern Christian beliefs based on pagan practice rather than scripture? A lot of the doctrine is based on pagan beliefs because the gospel was tainted by pagans, plain and simple. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's not to say that some who were brought up in the church did not have a genuine relationship with the Most High. Abraham was raised in a family of pagans, yet he was called out of it. So it's a wonderful thing that the lies are being exposed in these last days. We'll begin this session by talking about Aryan sun myths the origin of religions and this book was written in 1889 listen it says in ancient times there lived it is supposed on the highest elevation of central asia a noble race of men called the aryan speaking a language not yet sanskrit greek or german but containing the dialects of all this clan which had advanced to a state of agricultural civilization had recognized the bonds of blood and sanctioned the bonds of marriage that they worshipped nature the sun moon sky earth a comparison of ancient religions and mythology in the lands peopled by aryans demonstrates their chief object of adoration was the sun to this race in the infancy of its civilization the sun was not a mere luminary but a creator, ruler, preserver, and savior of the world. Listen to what it says. The Aryans looked up to the sky and gave it the name of Dius, from a root word which means to shine. When out of the forces and forms of nature they fashioned other gods, this name of Dius became Dius Petar, the heaven father or all father, the earth they worshipped as the mother of all. They said that the sun was the sun of the sky or the heaven father and that the immaculate virgin, the earth, sometimes it was the dawn or the night, was the mother of the sun. Hence we have the virgin or Virgo as one of the signs of the zodiac. As the sun begins its apparent annual northward journey on the 25th of December. Why is that important? Christmas Day. This day was said to be his birthday, the S-U-N, the sun god, and was observed with great rejoicings. There were numerous symbols which were held as sacred to the sun, the most common being the fish, the lamb, the cross, and the serpent. The serpent was an emblem of the sun when represented with its tail in its mouth, thus forming a circle. He was an emblem of eternity when represented as casting off his skin, but when represented with his deadly sting, he was an emblem of evil. When represented as crucified on the tree, the cross, the serpent denoted the sun in winter when it has lost its fructifying power. The Aryans observed various rites and ceremonies, among them being baptism and the sacrament of the Eucharist. It says, indeed, the doctrine of transubstantiation is one of the most ancient of doctrines. Let's begin by reading excerpts from this book entitled Paganism Surviving in Christianity. It was written in 1892 by Abram Lewis. He begins by saying, he who judges the first century by the 19th will fall into countless errors. 
He who thinks that Christianity of the 4th century was identical with that of the New Testament period will go widely astray. Why will they go astray? Because they are ignoring the many inconsistencies presented in times past as truth. We're now living in the last days and knowledge is increasing. It is the time when many are saying, I choose to be like the Bereans. I want to search the scriptures for myself to see if the things I have been told are true. He goes on to say, he who does not look carefully into the history of religions before the time of Christ and into the pagan influences which surrounded infant Christianity cannot understand its subsequent history. He who cannot rise above denominational limitations and creedal restrictions cannot become a successful student of early church history, nor of present tendencies, nor of future developments. Let's go on. It says the efforts of partisans to manipulate early history in the interests of special views and narrow conceptions have been a fruitful source of error. Equally dangerous has been the assumption that the Christianity of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries was identical with that of the New Testament or was a fair representative of it. The constant development of new facts shows that at the point where the average student takes up the history of Western Christianity, it was already fundamentally corrupted by pagan theories and practices. Its unfolding from that time to the present must be studied in the light of this fact, the rise, development, present status, and future history of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism cannot be justly considered apart from this fact. Listen, it says the fundamental principles and the underlying philosophy of these divisions of Christendom originated in the paganizing of early Christianity. This fact makes the restudy of the beginnings of Christianity of supreme importance. So it goes on to tell us, this field has been too nearly an unknown land to the average student, and therefore correct answers have been wanting to many questions which arise when we leave Semitic soil and consider Christianity in its relation to Greek and Roman thought. Early Christianity cannot be understood except in the light of these powerful pre-Christian currents of influence and present history cannot be separated from them. And here is why. The influence of pagan thought upon the Bible and its interpretation upon the organized church through the pagan water worship cult, upon the practices and spiritual life of the church by substituting pagan holidayism for Christian Sabbathism through the sun worship cult and upon the spiritual life and subsequent character of the church by the union of church and state and the subjugation of Christianity to the civil power according to the pagan model. Facts do not cease to be facts, though denied and ignored. It says the issues involved are larger than denominational lines or the boundaries of creeds. They are of special interest to Protestants since they involve not only the reasons for the revolt against Roman Catholicism, but the future relations of these divisions of Christendom 
to each other and to the Bible. And just FYI here, I'm reading the text as written for ease of understanding. But please know that our ancestors did not call themselves Jews, nor were they practicing the religion known as Christianity. With that in mind, let's keep going. It says, unconsciously, men think of the earliest Christianity as being like that which they profess. They measure the early centuries by their own, their church, its doctrines, forms, creeds, and customs, stands as the representative of all Christianity. It seems like a rude awakening to ask men to believe that there is a pagan residuum in their faith or in the customs of their fathers. It says, unhappily, there are too many who are unwilling to undergo such an enlargement of their religious and historical horizon as will make them competent to consider those facts which every earnest student of history must face. But the Christian who believes in the immortality of truth and in the certainty of its triumph will welcome all facts, even though they may modify the creed he has hitherto accepted. Now, I found this statement to be quite interesting. It says, Protestants in the United States are poorly prepared to consider so great a question as that which this book passes under review because... They have not carefully considered the facts touching their relations to Roman Catholicism. And I absolutely agree because there are some Christians who try to distance themselves from Catholics. But Catholics call Christians Catholics. Why? Because Christianity as it is known today was shaped by the Roman Catholic Church. So let's go on. It says, Truth was much obscured by the determined effort of Protestant writers to show that the pagan residuum was all in the Catholic Church, whereas the facts show that there could have been no Roman Catholic Church had not paganism first prepared the way for its development by corrupting the earliest Christianity, or let's state this correctly, they corrupted the way, the way that the early disciples and apostles lived. So it says, the first Roman converts to Christianity appear to have very inadequate ideas of the sublime purity of the gospel and to have entertained a strange medley of pagan idolatry and Christian truth. Listen, it says the first Christian emperor, talking about Constantine, was deeply imbued with the superstitions of paganism. He had been Pontifex Maximus, and it was only a little while before his death that he was formally received by baptism into the Christian church. He was particularly devoted to Apollo, and he attempted to conciliate his pagan and his Christian subjects by the respect which he appeared to entertain for both. So it goes on to say the student of history cannot fail to note the wide difference between the Christianity of the New Testament period and that of the fourth century. Something changed. It says the religion which Christ taught was a direct outgrowth of Judaism. In other words, he taught what was in the Old Testament. He taught Torah. And this is why it's so important to study to rightly divide. Most of us would agree that we believed what we were taught without studying or searching the scriptures to see if it was true. So he goes on to say, Messiah clarified and intensified the Ten Commandments. He discarded the outward formalities 
of the Jews and reach the heart of things by his interpretation of the ancient scriptures, by his precepts, his new precepts, and his example. And we know that he said he did not come to do away with the law. So if he didn't do away with it, who did? It goes on to say the earliest Christian congregations were communities for holy living upon the ground of a mutual faith in Christ. They expected still greater revelations of him and through him in the near future. So it says the Christianity of the third and fourth centuries presents the strongest possible contrast when placed alongside of that which existed during the New Testament period. It's different, you all. Things were changed. So it says, how did this change in the central character of Christianity come to pass? By what influences was it transformed from a system of right living to a system of metaphysical belief to right thinking rather than right doing? The answer is suggested by the fact that this change in character is contemporaneous with the transferring of Christianity from Semitic to Greek influence. Listen, it says, Meanwhile, we pause to examine the character of one of Constantine's earliest law. This is the man the Christians call the Prince of Christianity. He gave them a corrupted version of the gospel, or helped to bring this to the forefront, I should say. It was religious syncretism at its best. Listen to what this says. It says, One of Constantine's earliest laws, which has left a lasting influence on all Christian history, is his Sunday Edict of 321 AD. It is the more important to do this since the question of Sunday laws and their enforcement is now at the front. And it is well that the reader understand the source from which Sunday legislation sprung. This edict, edict of Constantine is the beginning of Sunday legislation. And it is not difficult to determine the influence which gave it birth. It says, the power to appoint holy days rested in the emperor. His voice was supreme in all such matters. It says there is every evidence that he acted in his proper capacity as Pontifex Maximus. And whatever notions may have entered into his determination to promulgate the edict, they could not have been Christian. On the other hand, there were abundant reasons why he should begin legislation in favor of Sunday. It was Apollo's day. Apollo was the patron deity of Constantine. He was the beautiful sun god. And Constantine was proud of his own personal beauty, because of which his fawning courtiers were accustomed to liken him to Apollo. So people were saying he looked like Apollo. Listen, it says the sun worship cult had been popular for a long time. Any favor shown to it would strengthen his influence with the first families of the empire. To exalt the day of the sun at such a time was a stroke of policy wholly in keeping with the universal practice of Constantine. So listen to the edict that he wrote. He said, let all judges and all city people and all tradesmen rest upon the venerable day of the sun. And look at how it spelled you all. They were not confused about who they were worshiping. It's not S-O-N. They wrote the day of the sun, S-U-N. It says, but let those dwelling in the country freely and with full liberty attend to the culture of their fields, since it frequently happens that no other day is so fit for the sowing of grain or the planting of vines. Hence, 
the favorable time should not be allowed to pass, lest the provisions of heaven be lost. So this was issued on the 7th of March, A.D. 321. Listen, in June of the same year, it was modified so as to allow the manumission of slaves on Sunday. The reader will notice that this edict makes no reference to the day as a Sabbath as the Lord's Day, or as in any way connected with Christianity. Neither is it an edict addressed to Christians. It goes on, nor is the idea of any moral obligation or Christian duty found in it. It is merely the edict of a heathen emperor addressed to all his subjects, Christian and heathen, who dwelt in cities and were tradesmen or officers of justice, commanding them to refrain from their business on the venerable day of the God whom Constantine most adored and to whom he loved in his pride to be compared. Now listen, on the following day, Constantine issued an edict with, with reference to consulting the pagan soothsayers in case of public misfortune, which, like the Sunday edict, is so purely heathen that no Christian emperor could have conceived or issued it. So listen to this, to this edict. If any part of the palace or other public works shall be struck by lightning, let the soothsayers following old usages inquire into the meaning of the portent and let their written words very carefully collected be reported to our knowledge. And also let the liberty of making use of this custom be accorded to others, provided they abstain from private sacrifices which are specifically prohibited. He says there is abundant evidence beyond the above that the Sunday law was the product of paganism. The language used speaks of the day only as the venerable day of the sun, a title purely heathen. It was sun worship. It was pagan. The author says there is not even a hint at any connection between the day and Christianity or the practices of Christians. And he's basically saying that nothing more is needed to show that the Sunday edict was the product of a heathen cult. He's saying there is an evident connection between the two edicts. Apollo was the patron deity of the soothsayers as well as of Constantine. At least nine years later than this, Constantine placed his new residence at Byzantium under the protection of the heathen goddess of fortune. He's a Christian now. Let's remember that. He never gave up the title of high priest of the heathen religion. He did not formally embrace Christianity until 16 years later. So whatever he did to favor Christianity and whatever claims he made to conversion were the outgrowth of a shrewd policy rather than of a converted heart. And when the conservative historian can say of him, the very brightest period of his reign is stained with crimes, which even the spirit of the age and the policy of an absolute monarch cannot excuse. He cannot be called a Christian prince. And now you will understand the true meaning behind the invention of Christmas. The scriptures are wholly silent as to the date of Christ's birth. The scriptures are silent. So it says the 25th of December, the winter solstice, was not fixed as Christmas until a long time after the New Testament period. But in spite of serious objections, historical and otherwise, that date triumphed. Well, why? The winter solstice was the date of the birth of Osiris, 
son of Isis, the Egyptian queen of heaven. The term Yule, another name for Christmas, comes from the Chaldee and signifies Child's Day. This name for the festival was familiar to Anglo-Saxons long before they knew anything of Christianity. So in Rome, this winter solstice festival was Saturn's festival, the wild, drunken, licentious Saturnalia. It was observed in Babylonia in a similar manner. When it came into Christianity, its leading features were like those of the Saturnalia. These have been far too prevalent from that time. Lighted candles and ornamented trees were a part of the observance of the festival among the pagans. The Christmas goose and Yule cakes came with the day from paganism. Now let's switch gears and read some excerpts from this book, Babylonian Religion and Mythology. This was written in 1903. Now let's see how Rome becomes Christian. In 313 CE, the Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which granted Christianity, as well as most other religions, legal status. While this was an important development in the history of Christianity, it was not a total replacement of traditional Roman beliefs with Christianity. This is what is called religious syncretism. You blend the two together. In 325, Constantine called the Council of Nicaea, which was a gathering of Christian leaders to determine the formal or orthodox beliefs of Christianity. These were not Israelites. These were Gentile converts. These were not men who had followed Messiah. The result of this council was the Nicene Creed, which laid out the agreed upon beliefs of the council. So they were binding some things. In 380 CE, the emperor Theodosius issued the Edict of, of Thessalonica, which made Christianity, specifically Nicene Christianity, the official religion of the Roman Empire. Most other Christian sects were deemed heretical, lost their legal status, and had their properties confiscated by the Roman state. So this would be the group who would say, no, what you're saying is heresy. That is not what scripture said. But they had to either adopt the beliefs that were handed down or they were going to take all of their substance. So was this a belief by faith or the result of forced conversion? It goes on. So it says the new festival of Christmas was specifically placed on the same date as the pagan Saturnalia, also known as Yule, or the winter solstice, intended to push the old religion into the shadows. Similarly, with Easter placed on the same date as Eostra, or Easter, and All Saints Day, which overshadows Samhain, also known as All Hallows' Eve or Halloween, all designated to create a Christian dictatorship. Listen, the priests of the time crafted an incredible storybook and used it to force the Roman Empire into fearful submission under the apparent will of their benevolent God. A new world order had been born. Unfortunately for the people, it wasn't born out of this benevolent God, but from his corrupted priests. Christianity grew out of Jewish traditions and was shaped by Roman cultural and political structures for several centuries. The head of the Roman Catholic Church, being the Pope, 
takes his title from the old Roman office of Pontifex Maximus, which is the high priest. Roman culture was not wholly replaced, but was often repurposed as it came into contact with other peoples and cultures. And this is the point you need to understand. Because many believe that the Roman Empire is dead. That is absolutely not true. It lives on through the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope serves as its leader. Listen to this information about the Pope. The Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth, is what they say. By divine right, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor. I don't care if you're Baptist, if you're non-denominational, if you're Methodist, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor and his flock. He is the true vicar, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. Did you see that? Put that in caps. All Christians. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author of and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth. Universal ruler of truth? Please listen to the blasphemy here. The arbiter of the world the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by no one. So they say the Pope is God himself on earth. This is quoted in the New York Catechism. So many of the laws and customs of Rome are practiced today unknowingly by Christians. I want to read some quotes and hope you're sitting down when you hear some of these. So pay attention to these and the sources are written beside it. Listen to this quote. The Pope and God are the same, so he has all power in heaven and on earth. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man but as it were God and the vicar of God. The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Wow! <laughs> Did you catch that? Even the precepts of Christ? The Pope has the authority and often exercised it to dispense with the command of Christ. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. Listen to this. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty they say. And there is more. It says, it is evident that the popes can neither be bound nor unbound. There you see binding and loosing. The popes can neither be bound nor unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the apostle Peter, if he should return upon the earth, since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs held the place of God upon earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man. We are then infallible, and whatever may be our acts, we are not accountable for them but to ourselves. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day 
and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And Christians have been doing it ever since. It goes on. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. And the last one, the Pope is the supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vice regent of Christ, who is not only a priest forever, but also king of kings and lord of lords. They made themselves kings and priests in the earth. Now let's take a look at the Pope's hat and make some connections. Do you see the star that's sitting there? It's called the Star of David. It is not. It's the Star of Remphan. According to Acts 7.43, it says, The Star of your God, Remphan, images which you made to worship and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. This is what our ancestors were worshiping also. It was considered pagan. So this star of David in the Hebrew Magen David or shield of David, Magen also is spelled Mogen. It's a Jewish symbol composed of two overlaid equilateral triangles that form a six-pointed star. It appears on synagogues, Jewish tombstones, and the flag of the state of Israel. Listen, Kabbalists popularized the use of the symbol as a protection against evil spirits. The Jewish community of Prague was the first to use the Star of David as its official symbol. And from the 17th century on, the six-pointed star became the official seal of many Jewish communities and a general sign of Judaism. Listen to this. Though it has no biblical or Talmudic authority, so what is it doing on the Pope's hat, you all? We will wrap up with this passage from Proverbs 4, 1 through 9. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. The information covered today is revealing that the gospel was hijacked. It was taken over by the Romans, the same people who persecuted our ancestors. Yes, we can add Catholic Church to it because that's what it's called today, the Roman Catholic Church. But it's the same people. They are the descendants of the same people. They are aligned with the group who say they are us. They made themselves kings and priests in the earth. But we need to understand what the word has said concerning us. We need to know what our father has said about us. He will forgive our iniquities. We have to turn away from this 
revised version of the gospel. And the Most High will tread down our enemies. He will restore favor unto us. Constantine brought a group together and they formulated the beliefs of the Christian church. Those laws have been binding for far too long. We need to begin to use the keys of the kingdom and loose ourselves from those restraints. When we come under the yoke of the Most High and cast off the restraints of paganism, he promised that he will forgive us and remember our sins no more. But we have to repent and turn. When you turn, you refuse to hold on to the ways and customs of Rome, of Babylon. The Roman religion brought death unto our people. The ways of the Most High is upright and true. It will not allow you to remain in sin and be comfortable. If you're breaking the laws of Yah and your heart is not convicting you, you need to check your fur because you may be a wolf, not a sheep. These pagan traditions do not honor him. They honor pagan deities. They were given to us by Gentiles. It's time to turn away because tomorrow is not promised to you. Turn away from fornication, adultery, shacking, sodomy, lying, cheating, stealing, and the list goes on and on. This is the time for you to get wisdom and understanding because he is not going to bless your mess. So I hope this message has been a blessing to you. Please remember to hit the like and share it. You're also welcome to, to subscribe if you have not already done so. We normally upload on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. Until next time, be blessed, family.